Hello and welcome to Liam's Lyceum. I'm your host, Liam, aka Himbar, and today I have another video on a fantasy essay for you. Now, I've done one of these previously. I did first uh, on Fairy Stories by J.R.R. Tolkien. Um, I'll probably link that one here, but I am going through some fantasy essays, mostly by some famous fantasy authors. This is the second one in that series, and this one is going to be From Elfland to Poughkeepsie by Ursula K. Le Guin. Now, this one is definitely a little different than Tolkien's as it's not really on answering questions like what is a fairy story, why are they important, and where did they originate from, but this is more on writing, like prose, and the importance of prose as a fantasy writer. Um, it's actually pretty interesting. It's way shorter than on fairy stories, um, and it, it, again, it has a slightly different topic. Now, I haven't actually read any fiction by Ursula K. Le Guin. Uh, I feel like that's one of the few crimes um, against the fantasy genre or the speculative fiction in general that I um, that you could accuse me of. As of right now, I do plan on fixing that. I do have a couple of her novels, actually. Um, it's just one I haven't got around to. There is a lot to read out there, folks. But um, this is a pretty interesting essay. I have a lot to say about it. A lot of its quotes, um, I do have some thoughts on her opinions, because this, again, is very much an opinion piece. Uh, just like Tolkien's, I found myself agreeing almost 100% of the time with Tolkien. This one is a little different, but I still think it is relevant for today. The essay itself came out in 1973, and uh, I think you can find it in a few collections. I found this one online in some PDF. Maybe I'll link that below if I can find it again. So, so she initially starts with comparing Elfland, which she does, you know, say this is basically every fantasy world, like Middle Earth and everything. She's just going to call it Elfland, uh, naming it, you know, I think, well, she's a big fan of Dunsany. So, uh, whatever. Um, so, she compares Elfland to national parks like Yosemite and Yellowstone, right? Saying, instead of going to spend time um, in nature or in, like, experiencing the grand natural beauty of places like Yellowstone and Yosemite, which are, again, natural parks in the United States, for those unaware, um, tourists actually end up going and they basically feel right at home, right? It's not so much of a new experience, but... Uh, the tourist industry obliges them by, you know, giving them six lane highways, I think is what she says, like drive in movie theaters um, to make, you know, these people who are coming with their boats and their ATVs and their fold out chairs to make it feel like they're back home in Poughkeepsie, uh, which is just the name of the city she uses. Um, I think it may be because of a quote she uses later, but this is just a city of New York for those unaware. It's one of the funny name, but um, I think it's a native name actually, but that's not really important to the story. Um, so basically, she's criticizing uh, the simpleness of it. Uh, she's criticizing writing, essentially. She's coming in here and she's saying, you, if you're in Elfland, you write like you're in Elfland. You don't write like you're in Poughkeepsie. And she's basically saying, I've seen some writing in Elfland that belongs in Poughkeepsie. Um, so she's really criticizing. She doesn't really criticize um, really any authors by name unless she feels like she can say more positives, I feel like, about them. We'll get into that too, though. So she says, quote, but the point about Elfland is that you are not at home there. It's not Poughkeepsie. It's different. So she then defines fantasy. Uh, this is actually probably one of the best definitions of fantasies I've ever read of. I've known about this quote for years, but um, she succinctly describes it as escapism. Then she goes into it as art, and that's where she has her more famous description as she says, it is a different approach to reality, an alternative technique for apprehending and coping with existence. It is not anti-rational, but para-rational, para not realistic, but surrealistic, super-realistic, a heightening of reality. And Freud's terminology employs primary, not secondary process thinking. It employs archetypes, which Jung warned us are d dangerous things. Dragons are more dangerous and a good deal commoner than bears. Fantasy is near to poetry, to mysticism and to insanity than naturalistic fi fiction is. It is a real wilderness, and those who go there should not feel too sate, safe, and their guides, the writers of fantasy, should take their responsibilities seriously. So she starts off there, she's going to end there, basically, too, um, just so you're aware. It, it, again, is a pretty good example of just good essay writing, decent rhetoric, honestly. Um, so 
she then tricks us by showing us a passage. Um, it's a passage uh, that she says is from fantasy. It's really not. She's just changed four words from a, like, a contemporary, I don't even remember what it was, like some thriller or something like that. And I think that's where the Poughkeepsie is mentioned. Um, but then she also says, that's bad, that this is bad example of fantasy writing that I've seen, essentially, even though this thing wasn't written in fantasy. She's basically saying, you shouldn't be able to cut up she changes four words, right? You shouldn't be able to change just a few words and all of a sudden it's not fantasy anymore. That's essentially what she's saying, right? So she shares three examples. We were actually from E.R. Edison, who wrote The Warm Water Boris and such. Kenneth Morris, who I'd actually never heard of before. Uh, I don't know what's going on there. And then J.R. Tolkien, of course. Um, and then she says that these are essentially Elfland accents, the quote she uses from them. Uh, and they have different lay levels of archaism there that they have but basically the speech is different from everyday speech it's not colloquial at all um then this is where she really gets into criticizing style after a brief like really harsh criticism of i would call knockoff heroic fantasy she's basically critiquing it almost sounds like sword and sorcery in general um there's like obviously she like doesn't ever mention uh moorcock or howard or to camp. Um, she just mentioned Lynn Carter. She actually mentioned Lynn Carter um, in a very good light, uh, mostly for his um, adult fantasy line that he did for Valentine, I think, back in the day. So she actually really praises him for that, those compilations, making him older fantasy and new fantasy available for adults, right? So she wasn't, that doesn't get lost in the kids section or the myth section or whatever. Um, let's see. She also goes into saying, like, these nobles and, like, lords and magicians from Elfland, you know, they don't say, I told you so. That's, like, they don't talk like us, right? Essentially is what she's trying to say. And they also don't waste words. Uh, every word they say is meaningful. Um, I think that's mostly... It's interesting because one way you, you take that is, like, well, if they're supposed to be real, that's not actually the case. But as a writer, she's trying to say that that is the case. Every word you put in there needs to be meaningful. You don't need to be wasting words. She says, she basically says then that the best <laughs> um, is Lord Dunsany. She says she's not even able to be imitated. Um, and he, she compares him even a little bit to the King James Bible, which is pretty interesting. Uh, she then lectures heavily on archaisms, uh, which I would say definitely have fallen out of style uh, these days. This is from 73. That's the same year my mother was born. Um, so she uh, ridiculed those who can't use thou correctly who can't do, uh, well, or any of its inflections particularly, and then or can't conjugate a verb into the second uh, person singular, who can't use the subjunctive at all, basically. Um, it's actually rather harsh, but it kind of makes sense. She's basically making fun of pseudo-archaic, um, or what you would really call archaisms, because most archaisms are not archaic. They're trying to come off like they're archaic to give themselves some credibility, right? And that's basically what she's saying. This is still the idea that these other authors lend themselves some credibility by connecting themselves with what would really be called proto-fantasy or myth in some cases, um, right? She even, like, goes into saying, like, like, could the Beowulf author, like, stand up and just cite some alliterative verse? And I was just like, it's really silly. She comes off really harsh in some cases, actually. Um, but actually, for the most part, I still agree with her. I think some of her ideas are really opinionated and maybe a point from the times, you know what I mean? Like, the fact that she says E.R. Edison is the best at archaisms, she's probably not wrong in maybe some idea, in some sense. I haven't read very much Edison, so I can't say a lot there, but she also thinks Dunstan is the best, and I'm, I haven't read a lot of Dunstan either, but I don't agree as far as that goes. And as far as archaisms goes, I'd much rather read um, Morris, not Kenneth Morris, who she's mentioned, but William Morris, um, since she originally said fantasy is more akin to poetry, and William Morris is... 100% that. Uh, I love William Morris's uh, fantasy, especially the House of the Wolfings, because I don't know, maybe 70% of the House of the Wolfings is actually in verse. Um, even though I called it a prose romance. I guess there's prose in it, so whatever fits. Anyways, that's just kind of an aside. She then says that Kenneth Morris and James Branch Cable, never heard of this guy either, are the best at comic heroic writing, and then that they make her laugh out loud, but they still somehow fit into Elfland because it's not, I don't know, their confidence in it there but it fits and it's not some changing style which is where she also then criticizes fritz leiber and rogers and lasney that they change their style 
and that's bad. It's, and she basically says, she seems to like, I feel like they're con like they, they're good writers, essentially what she's saying, but maybe they don't seem like they're confident. Maybe they seem like that they are not serious enough because they're writing fantasy, so maybe they're falling victims of what others were saying or how they treated fantasy at the time, um, which is weird, you know, considering I've never heard of Morris, I've never heard of Cable, and I love Liber, and I think Zelazny has some of the best prose I've ever read. Um, just flat out, honestly. I think that's really interesting that, that she went to make that comparison. She also praises Jack Vance similarly to Liber, though it is less harsh, um, Liber and Zelazny. She says Jack Vance is really good. He doesn't actually use archaisms at all, but he still fits well in Elfland, while she's essentially saying Zelazny and Liber sometimes fit in Elfland, and sometimes they go into like this more colloquial language or style, which I think works, honestly, for their style from the bits I've read. I've only read three Zelazny books, but Amber, I mean, our world exists, so a colloquial style works. You know, it's it's not some high fantasy uh, like Edison's Wormwood Wars or Tolkien's Middle Earth. Uh, though Middle Earth is kind of antediluvian Earth, but that's a different topic for a different day. Um, but Libraries, I think it still works anyways. And Libra does have actually kind of a multiverse thing going on anyways, and then who cares? Anyways, it works. Um, that's my opinion anyways. Uh, she also says, Tolkien has a simple prose, which is interesting. I think a lot of people wouldn't agree with that. I actually find that actually pretty true. He doesn't use a ton of archaisms. Uh, I find out he, he does use some. I think he, he definitely has a mythic style going for him, but she doesn't mention that at all. Um, she says a lot of people, though, can say, oh, Tolkien has simple prose, so I also have a simple prose, so I'm good at writing fantasy. She's like saying, no, yours isn't simple. It's plain. It's vague. It's unimaginative. Um, it is inappropriate. Um, she says that's more of the style for objectivity of journalism. Um, Anyways, <laughs> this is her roundabout way of getting to that fantasy um, isn't easy, as you would assume, to write for. You can't just walk in, basically, and write with no thought. You need to be prepared. This is her... The reason she's kind of being harsh here is because she's saying, like, look at Edison, look at Dunsany, look at Tolkien. You don't have to be as good as them, but aim for something like this. Um, which, again, is interesting. Uh, a lot of people would not say you probably shouldn't even aim exactly for Tolkien. Um, but I can agree, honestly, in some ways, like... I go and read some fantasy, uh, and I'm like, wow, this is really well written. Uh, and, you know, it does fit what I kind of want from prose. Um, I like purposeful prose. I've made a video about this before, actually. If you're making a point to be, like, just writing what you think you should, because I've seen different authors write different styles with different books, and I feel like that's kind of how it should be anyways. I see some authors who, it's like a fantasy world, but it doesn't feel like a fantasy world because their prose is just so non-formed. I mean, it is inappropriate. Like she says here, it's vague. Uh, it's plain. <laughs> so it's pretty interesting. Um, cause again, I do agree with her on some, um, things. It's easier to digest here because on fairy stories, it's like 60 pages. This was, I don't know, maybe like 10 or so. I can't remember. Uh, she also says this quote, many readers, many critics, and most editors speak of a style as if it were an ingredient of a book in the, sh uh, like the sugar in a cake or something added unto the book, like a frosting on the cake. The style, of course, is the book. If you remove the cake, all you have left is a recipe. If you remove the style, all you have left is a synopsis of the plot. So she then says basically that style is the writer. That's how they see the world. It's their voice. It's their understanding. Um, which makes sense, actually. That's actually kind of the whole point. Uh, I've seen similar things before. I believe it's uh, Jim Butcher's. He was bet uh, that he... Um, he could turn any bad idea into a good book, right? And that he was told, like, combine Pokemon with the, the Lost Legion of Rome or whatever, and he wrote Codex Alara, which I haven't read. Um, I've only read a couple of Jim Butcher books, and they were okay. Um, and so I don't know if I'll ever read Codex Alara. Maybe if I have time someday, but I, at this point, I feel like I'll never have time. Um, you know, so, like, but that's a good example, right? Like, that's basically what Le Guin is saying, that it's it's the writer, you know what I mean? Because if, if you just had the Lost Legion of Rome and Pokemon, that is basically what she said here, right? You would just have a synopsis of a plot. You wouldn't actually have a book. Um, so that's pretty interesting. Um, she then uh, makes the important point that to create what, okay, this quote, to create what Tolkien calls a secondary universe is to make a new world, a world where no voice has ever spoken before, um, where the act of speech is the act of creation. The only voice that speaks there is the creator's voice and every word counts. Uh, this 
ties really well in uh, Tolkien's idea of separation, actually. Um, you can see it actually in his poem, Mythopoeia, as well. Um, it's really cool, actually, how she's like leading into that idea that where the act of speech is the act of creation, because this stuff doesn't exist once it once you make it exist, it exists. Though um, it's a uh, very interesting, like the a tree is a tree type of thing from the poem Mythopoeia is really something that you should you should go listen to. I, I did it actually Mythopoeia. If you want to listen to it, it's kind of hard to find online. So if you want to read to my not very good reading of it, then go and listen to that. Um, then she closes with. And lastly, I believe that the reader has a responsibility. If he loves the stuff he reads, he has a duty toward it. That duty is to refuse to be fooled, to refuse to permit commercial exploitation of the holy ground of myth, to reject shoddy work and to save his praise for the real thing, because when fantasy is the real thing, nothing after all is realer. And again, this gets into the concept of what is real anyways, uh, that Tolkien kind of touches on as well and on fairy stories. Um, but then this is also really getting into consumerism. Uh, basically, she's saying uh, throughout this that you can make money writing fantasy stories, so don't let just people think it's easy come in here write a fantasy story. And basically saying, give them bad reviews. <laughs> that's, that's kind of what she's saying, at least that's how I take it. Um, so again, it's interesting though, because in some ways I definitely, I could say this sentiment's largely a product of its time with the archaism things, but even then I think it's mostly just her opinion. Um, most people would read E.R. Edison and be like, yeah, that's not for me at all. And I think a lot of people would even read Lord Dunsany that way. And I know a lot of people would read William Morris that well, way as well, and I know she doesn't even quote him, but I'm a big fan of Morris, and I know that it's definitely not for everyone. Um, I think it is important. Style is important. Um, I think, for example, like a good modern writer would be Rocchio. His style is very well done. I think he does a good job of following what... Um, following the good advice that Le Guin gives and you know you can just ignore her her opinions or however or take them as you will I guess whatever um but it's interesting again that she thinks pro shouldn't be colloquial and I, I have some thoughts again on Liber and Zelazny I kind of disagree with her um and with uh Dunsany and Edison I'm a little uh reticent to uh you know agree with her uh fully on the idea of how great they are so um, it's pretty interesting, but again, I like that she, like, you need to know what you're getting into as a writer. Um, you don't have to be archaic these days, though, also, <laughs> and it is a serious responsibility in some ways. I mean, like, at least these days, you're more likely to get published writing crappy books. I mean, just to put that bluntly, uh, there are a lot of, you can self-publish so easy these days. Um, you can do indie publishing, which I'm not lumping all, I've read some great indie published books, I've read some great self-published books. And I've read some terrible traditionally published books, so that's not, I'm not criticizing all that, but um, you got to be careful. You got to, you got to be careful with what you're writing in a sense. I'm not saying you can't do it. Go ahead, write some crap. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, it, for, at the same time, I say this, like, as someone who does like to write, I'm glad I didn't ever finish anything I was writing, basically, when I was younger because that stuff is not stuff I'd want to see. Just like Gene Wolfe didn't like his first published novel, Operation Aries, and it was never reprinted. Um, so, I mean, like, uh, assuming you actually improve, then that's good, right? The improvement is really important. She doesn't really get into that, but, uh, you know, that's that's a good idea. Anyways, so those are my thoughts on From Elfland to Poughkeepsie by Ursula K. Le Guin. I will be doing more of these. I have at least one more I added to the list, I don't remember what it's called um, since the original four I had, and I, there's a potential um, a sixth and seventh as well. Maybe more beyond that. I'll probably keep on doing these as I find them, but that'll probably, there probably won't be a lot. <laughs> so I know this one will come out probably after my book two anniversary. I'm filming it way before that, but um, thanks for watching. Uh, you can go watch On Fairy Stories if you want, and just heads up, the next one I'm going to be doing is Epic Pooh by Michael Moorcock. So this one's probably... Well, it's definitely different than the first two, and uh, maybe a little less well-known compared to these first two as well. These are probably the most popular ones, so. But, uh, Liam Leams Lyceum, I'll catch you next time.